Mark chapter 14, and the setting is the Lord has been arrested, and all his disciples, as he said, they would be scattered, they would desert him, and they all desert him, and now he is in the process to go in front of the Jewish authorities three times, and also the Roman authorities, he confronted Pilate twice, and also heard. And uh, as we look at this passage tonight regarding this miscarriage of justice, this highest degree regarding the glorious Saviour. But it was no accident, it was an appointment, it was part of God's plan um, well, and will, as we look at this passage tonight. So in Mark chapter 14, verse 53. Mark chapter 14, verse 53. It's good to see everyone here tonight. Um, the Lord bless everyone is. Okay, Mark 14, verse 53. And they led Jesus away, that was from the garden of Gethsemane, to the high priest. And with them were assembled all the chief priests, and the elders, and the scribes. And Peter followed him far off. Even into the palace of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death, and found none. For many were false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and were false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple. That is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. And the chief priests stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answer it by none. What is it that these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto them, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. There's no escape of where I will see him. And the high priest went his clothes and said, What need we any further witnesses? We have heard the blasphemy. What think you? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. And some began to spit on him, to cover his face and to buffet him. Say unto them, prophesy. And the servants that strike him with the palms off their hands. And the Lord bless this portion of scripture to us this evening. God had given the servant Moses around 1400 years, regarding this account previous, 3400 years today, basically, in our generation, to pen the words of the first five books of the Bible. Some of these books were specifically targeted towards a nation God had chosen called Israel. In a nutshell, if the people of Israel obeyed the word of God, they would be immensely blessed. God would shine his face upon them, they would do God's favour. But if they disobeyed, rebelled, in their sin, they would be judged severely. It was conditional. God had a covenant with the children of Israel. If they obeyed, if they followed his statutes and laws, they were blessed. If they disobeyed, God would chastise them. But to cultivate society and to make it a success, to function properly, the nation of Israel needed to follow God's statutes for guidance and instruction. And in the book of Leviticus, especially on the Deuteronomy, God gives the nation of Israel special instruction and guidance regarding, regarding laws of the land and for their government. You see, God has instituted marriage, God has instituted government, and God has instituted the church. Those are three institutions God has instituted. And of course, those three things are under serious attack. Of course, the marriage union is under severe attack today. It's never been since, since many, many, many centuries. 
as the Norwich you didn't know there's such a tax. And then our government, of course, you need government, because if you do government, there'll be anarchy, and of course the church as well. So God has instituted three institutions, the church, um, government, and Norwich. So for a society to function properly, you need a judicial system. Part of that is this instruction emphasizes the importance of how people govern themselves in a system that was righteous and just. Like any other nation to function properly, Israel needed a judicial system which was righteous, fair and just. And of course that will never happen properly until Christ returns and sets up his own kingdom on this earth which is a righteous system which is just, which is fair. But by the time of Jesus' ministry, in the first century, 1400 years previous, when Moses penned those first five books of the Bible, the Jewish people had developed a sophisticated system, philosophy of law, based on the principles outlined in the Mosaic Law of Moses, especially in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. They pride themselves on maintaining a just and fair society enforced by a system of courts and judges. A local council or court could be established in any town in Israel with at least 120 men. Each council, known as a Sanhedrin, you've heard me mention that name many times, Sanhedrin, what does it mean, Sanhedrin? It basically means sitting together, provided what is coming together, these men sitting together in a council, which was known as a Sanhedrin, which provided a legal rule or governance over its subjects, over its community. In many judicial cases, these local councils had 23 men voted in the day with trials and come up with a verdict. The reason why there was an odd number was because there was always, it would always be a majority decision. There was 23 in the local council, in the local towns in Israel, regarding the judicial system. But to go even further, there was the Supreme Court of Israel. We have the High Court. But in Israel, there was a Supreme Court located in Jerusalem, the city of David, their main city, which was known as the Great Sanhedrin, which consisted of 71 members, including the high priest, the chief priest, the elders, and the scribes, mainly from the two main religious parties, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. This Supreme Court of 71 members met daily in the temple, except on the Sabbath or in any other holy days, such as the Day of Atonement or Passover, etc. etc. The Great Sanhedrin was the most powerful Jewish legal and judicial body in Israel. But sadly, the time of Christ it had become significantly corrupted both politically and religiously, despite being founded on the principles established in the Mosaic Law. Pride, social prominence and political compromise with the Romans had corrupted the purity of this judicial system. It had corrupted the purity of this judicial system, but still to this point, their Jewish legal system provided those accused of a certain crime, several protections for the victim. First of all, a public trial had to be held during daylight hours. This was their custom, this was their law. A public trial had to be held during daylight hours, not during the night, in the early hours of the morning. Secondly, they had to, they had to give time for the accused an adequate opportunity to make or have a case for defence. <coughs> Thirdly, unless there was a testimony of at least two witnesses, 
the charge would be rejected. Perjury, which means bearing false witness, was taken very seriously and had very severe consequences if proven that person was analyzed. Perjury is really burning false witness. Canalize to try and sink someone. The person who was found out bearing false witness, then it was turned right around that the charge of the penalty of that crime was to be forced on against that person who committed perjury, who told birthplace lies to try and get someone charged with a crime. When the death penalty was enforced on the guilty party, the person or persons who testified against the accused was to inflict the first blows of execution, which was normally in the Jewish custom stoning the death, being the Jewish form of capital punishment. That's what they did to Stephen, stoning the death. But in Jewish law, capital cases sanctioned that a full day. A 24-hour period must be completed between the proclamation of the guilty verdict and the actually carrying out of the death sentence. During that interval, interlude time period of at least 24 hours, the members of the court of the Great Sanhedrin, 71 members, would fast and take time to reflect, reflect soberly on the very serious verdict they had delivered Plus, it would give a window of opportunity for maybe further evidence to be found. Such trials were forbidden to be conducted on the day before a Jewish religious feast. It was forbidden. It seems their Jewish law system was just fair and merciful up to this point. But at the trial of Jesus, the great Sanhedrin practically broke every one of its judicial laws. Such corruption, such injustice. Everything that happened to Jesus in the early morning, being a Friday after his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, was a very serious, serious miscarriage of justice. The Sanhedrin had broken every single judicial law. The trial of Jesus consisted of two major phases. As he stood before the Jewish religious authorities three times and then the Roman authorities three times. In this passage we've read tonight, Mark focuses on Jesus standing before the Jewish authorities in which was a clear violation of the Mosaic Law. It was a kangaroo court as Jesus' trial took place in private at night, it was supposed to be during the day, just hours before the Passover feast began, it was forbidden for them to have any court proceedings before a feast. They had no credible witnesses either, no proper defense. They sanctioned an illegitimate verdict and wanted immediate execution instead of 24 hours time period for the defense and for them to ponder and realize they're making the right decision. Such corruption, such injustice as they were willing to break every rule to have Jesus executed. It was their mandate. And they would have went to any lengths whatsoever. It was the highest degree of evil, <coughs> hatred, bitterness against the greatest and most perfect person, their own Messiah, ever to walk in this planet, the sinless, perfect, spotless Lamb of God. Yet he was so good to them, he fed them. He didn't condemn them. He fed them. He did multiple, multiple miracles. He healed their sick. He cast sickness out of Israel practically. He raised their dead. He told them the truth. 
And what did they do? They put him on a cross. And the Bible tells us even the words of Christ when he got a great interview with Nicodemus. And this is the condemnation. The light has come into the world. A man of darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Lightness has come into the world. Jesus Christ came amongst his own people. But sadly they rather had darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. I wonder tonight as I branch off for a few minutes. Do you love darkness rather than light? Are you still in the kingdom of darkness? Does the prince of darkness still have a stronghold in your life? If you're not saved, folks, save from your darkness of sin. Save from the darkness which awaits a person to die in their sin. The darkness of that horrendous place called hell will be gnashing and weeping. I wonder, have you been delivered from your darkness? Or do you still love darkness rather than light? You see, the word of God exposes sin. Christ exposes sin. God is light and in him is no darkness. God is holy. And are you still holding on to your sin, your darkness, or folks, are you saved, walking in the light, children of the dead, children of the light? Christ is the light of the world. Are you in Christ? Have you truly repented? Have you truly come with yourself? Have you truly come God's way in Jesus Christ? And truly and ultimately has been a time in your life, you know your life has been transformed, you're born of the spirit, regenerated, a new child, a new creature in Jesus Christ, old things passed away, and we desire pursuing the things of holiness, our brother asked about the prayer meeting, and it is essential, I still keep saying from this pulpit, I believe one of the one of the crises in this land, this generation, is the lack of prayer. Have you desire for the place of prayer? Or you just send prayers every night and not truly really saved, which I used to do years ago. I used to ask the Lord to forgive me the sins every night, but it was never true repentance. It was my terms, not his terms. You see, folks, to be saved is in God's terms, and it's repentance. Repent ye lest likewise you shall curse. I wonder, are you like these people in Israel, the majority of the masses? That they love their darkness rather than light when Christ came, God manifested in the flesh and done good to them, and yet in their evil, they put them on the cross. So, from these number of verses here tonight, as I've already given you a catalog, in a sense, of the judicial system in Israel, how they prided themselves in this judicial system, the Sanhedrin. And yet in Jesus' trial, they broke every practice, every law, statute regarding your judicial system. It was a kangaroo trial. It was a miscarriage of justice to the highest degree. But from this passage, we can discover here this miscarriage of justice. We can first of all point out the illegal court. Secondly, we can look at the illegal witness. Thirdly, we can look at the illegal interrogation and finally we can discover the illegal charge regarding this miscarriage of justice kangaroo co trial Jesus experienced with these so called religious people. So first of all from our passage tonight here we have the illegal court. Verse fifty three and fifty four. It says on the day of Jesus away to the high priest and with them were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And Peter followed him afar off, even into the house of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. The illegal court. Do you realize that you're going to stand before God someday and it's not going to be in the legal court? Believer, do you realize you're going to stand in the judgment seat of Christ and be interviewed to see what we have done for him in this earth? Praise God, our sins are gone. Christ has dealt with that. But, but what about our faithfulness? What about our service? Similarly, do you realize you're going to stand in front of the great court of the great white throne judgment? 
And every sin will be recorded. And there's no escape. There's no mercy. There's no grace. And you'll be cast into the lake of fire forever. There'll be no corruption in this court. It is perfect. It is transformed. It is the one who is omniscient, who searches every heart and understands the imaginations of the thoughts. Everything is naked towards him. There'll be no barristers, there'll be no solicitors, there'll be no excuses, there'll be no defense in this court. But tonight here we're going to look at this corrupt, illegal court, this kangaroo trial, this, this miscarriage of justice. And this illegal court and guilty verdict had already been premeditated, determined before this trial when Jesus stood before Honest, the former high priest, John 11, verse 50 tells us, making this woman say that it was unfair. It was imbalanced. It was just a mere formality to get Jesus executed as quickly as possible, in which the high priest, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes, in verse 50, they gathered together, singing of the same hymn sheet, in order to condemn Jesus and have him executed. Jesus was first taken to us, the former high priest, John 18, verse 12, explains that, who seems to have such a major influence on Caiaphas, the high present high priest, who was his son in law. Verse 53 then led Jesus away to the high priest. It was actually Annas, who was the former high priest, first. At one time or another, Annas. Had five sons who held position or office of high priest. In addition to his son in law, Caphas, at this present time, it was in a sense like a first century mafia family, in which Thomas, the boss, and his sons controlled the lucrative temple operation when extortionate prices were being charged to worshippers who were purchasing sacrificial animals, especially during the Great Feast, as Annas and his family were cashing in on. It was an extortionate movement of trade during the Feast of Passover, or Tabernacles, or Pentecost. They were making a fortune, extortionate prices against Jewish worshippers as they were cashing in on it. But Jesus Christ and his ministry, we looked at last week, disrupted their corrupt enterprise, their root of their business, by clearing the temple facility, which in return activated their hatred toward Jesus even more and more. Jesus disrupted their root of their business, he exposed their hypocrisy and their covetousness. So Jesus appears before all his first. Likely his residence being located across the courtyard from Caiaphas, the high priest's place, where he and the members of the Sanhedrin appeared. In John 18, verse 13, I'll just read it out here. It says here, And led Jesus away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Verse 19 it says, The high priest Annas, this is then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whether the Jews also resort, and in secret I have said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me. What I have said unto them, behold, they know what I have said. Immediately after this interrogation, Jesus Annas stood, showed up, he should have released Jesus because the Lord had nothing to hide. The Lord said, Annas, you've heard me, the people of Israel have heard me in the temple, they've heard me in the synagogues, they've heard me in the public places, preaching the word of God. Annas should have released Jesus immediately after that interrogation because he could find no father. He could not charge the Lord of anything, especially a capital offence. In fact, the Lord's response was neither inappropriate or inaccurate, but was fulfilling the legal requirement of the law 
regarding witnesses if he wanted to bring charges against Jesus, as many have heard Jesus speak publicly, being no hidden matter in which Thomas should have knew about. The Lord's words were truth. They were transformed. They were not hidden. There was no deceptiveness in his public ministry as the Lord's hands were clean. And it's the exact same. The folks, the Lord does not deceive anyone. Every person will be judged by this book. It is in front of us. This is God's revelation. It is not complicated. God has shown us that it is transformed to this world, to this town, to our family members, to our loved ones, to our friends, to whoever else is in our mind. God's words is there. Everyone will be judged by it. Nobody can say, oh Lord, you didn't tell me this. And they he did. He's given us his full revelation. And Jesus was transformed in his ministry. Apart from the time when he started speaking in parables, which was a judgment on the religious leaders, he had finished speaking to them. He started speaking in parables, which was a hidden, a hidden message in it, which was a judgment that the religious leaders did not understand. But apart from that, the Lord always spoke transformed, no hidden or deceptive ways in his public ministry. It was the truth, always, and his hands were clean. Honest was without an excuse. He should have released Jesus there and then. Honest knew that Jesus spoke publicly to the multitudes in different places. It wasn't a hidden agenda. Mark interprets the narrative here, the story at this point, by bringing Peter back into the drama, who seemed to have mixed feelings of fear and loyalty. In verse 54, and Peter followed him afar off, even to the palace of the high priest, and he sat to the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Peter seemed to have mixed feelings here. Peter had scattered in the garden of Gethsemane when the Lord was arrested after he. He took the sword to Malchus and the Lord healed the ear. Didn't even he actually restored, gave him another ear. What a miracle. Peter and the rest of them fled the scene then. But the Lord was arrested and then brought to this courtyard in front of Thomas. And Peter had mixed feelings of fear and loyalty. As in the garden, Peter and the rest of the disciples fled the scene. But soon after Jesus' arrest, Peter built up the courage. Maybe in his pride, showing his loyalty, as he had mentioned earlier to Jesus in the same chapter, verse 29. But Peter said unto him, The Lord, who all shall be offended, yet will not I. But Peter would never, he says to the Lord, Lord, I will never be ashamed of thee, I will never forsake thee. As he followed the Lord that night at a distance and came right into enemy territory. Making himself vulnerable, he went outside of God's will at this time. And when we go out of God's will, folks, we will make ourselves vulnerable. We will be an enemy territory. And soon will deny and forsake the Lord three times when challenged as being one of Jesus' disciples, which the Lord predicted in verse 54. It says, And Peter followed him before all things the house of the high priest and sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Verse 72. And the second time the rooster the cock crew and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him before the, the rooster the cock crew twice, thou shalt deny me three times thrice. So we've discovered here the illegal court. The Lord stood in trial, first of all, in front of the former high priest, Thomas. Honest should have released them there and then because the Lord's ministry was public, there was nothing to hide. He could not find anything, no fault in them. But secondly, here we have the illegal witnesses as we move on. The illegal witnesses, verse 55. And the chief priests and all the council of the San Peter, and sadly one of them, sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. The illegal witnesses. For many bore false witnesses against them, but their witness agreed not together. 
Having failed to charge Jesus, honestly and signs the Lord across the courtyard to Caiaphas, his son-in-law, his house, where the entire Sanhedrin was assembled. A march was standing in front of 71 people. Apart from two, we know of Joseph of Arimathea and also Nicodemus. They were converted with the rest of them. They wanted Jesus murdered. Knowing the urgent need to charge Jesus before they could convict him, they could not find a legitimate reason to do so in verse 55. And the chief priests and the council sought witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. According to the Jewish law, the Sanhedrin were not permitted to initiate charges but only to investigate them regarding the cases which were presented to them. Yet all rules were broken at the trial of Jesus. Such corruption as they acted illegally as prosecutors searching for evidence to charge Jesus. They stood that low by giving false testimonies against the Lord. They were breaking the moral law about a false witness. On all liars will have their place in the lake of fire was burning for fire and brimstone. They were given false testimonies against the Lord in this kangaroo trial, in this miscarriage of justice, by willing to lie in order to manufacture a capital crime, but their testimonies were not consistent. Verse 56, for many were false witness against them, but their witness agreed not to gather. Eventually, in their rapid determination, they found two willing liars, Matthew 26 explains that, who twisted the solid words the Lord had spoken three years earlier at the beginning of his ministry regarding the temple. Of course, they took it out of context and twisted what the Lord was meaning. He was meaning his own body. Death and resurrection. Not the little temple in Jerusalem. It says here in verse 57, And there arose certain and were and false witness against them. There was two false liars, it says in Matthew 26. And we heard him say in verse 58, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And within three days I will build another made without hands. They completely twisted the Lord's teaching here. Perverted it. They, were, they had no concept what the Lord was meaning. They thought that he was speaking about the literal temple. Herod's temple at that time in Jerusalem. No, the Lord was speaking about his, his death and resurrection, his own body, being the temple. And it reminds us regarding liars. Two liars came on the scene here and tried to manufacture a capital crime against Christ. And also it happened with Jezebel, a priest in this a number of years ago, regarding covetousness. Ahab was the king of the northern kingdom, and you think he didn't have enough, he had everything the world could offer, but he wanted Naboth's vineyard as a holiday home, and it was holiday home, he wanted the vineyard as well. And Naboth would not sell him. And as a result, he went back to his evil wife, Jezebel, and she plotted a scheme and got two liars to turn around and say that Naboth had blasphemed God. And when he blasphemed God, it was a capital offense, death penalty. The two liars, two willing liars in this capital case against Jesus. But yet they could not come to an agreement because the testimonies were still not consistent with one another as they could not coordinate the case against them in verse 59. But neither so did their witness agree to gather. So we've looked here at the illegal witnesses. We've looked at the illegal court. Thirdly here, as we move on very quickly regarding this miscarriage of justice, we have the illegal interrogation, verse 60 and 61a. And the high priest stood up, Caiaphas, in the midst, and asked Jesus, saying, Answer us by nothing. 
What is it which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered, Nothing. Caiaphas, the high priest, pounced on a elaborated recording the subject of the temple being destroyed, in which these two false witnesses put forward. Jesus knew that no reply was needed because of his innocence, as he refused to get engaged with these twisted false mock proceedings by giving them any form of being legit. Also the Lord was fulfilled in scripture once again. Isaiah 53 says he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth. This leads me to the final point here. The illegal charge against Christ and this miscarriage of justice. Verse 61 b calf us again then. He comes forward and he says Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting in the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. The illegal charge. The high priest Caiaphas was not satisfied by Jesus being silent, but continued to barrage the Lord with another question, Art thou the Christ? The son of the blessed, he says. Caiaphas had some cheek to even ask the Lord that. This was a hypocritical contradiction from the court of Caiaphas. It was a hypocritical con contradiction. One minute he was demanding truth because Christ is the Son of Man, the Son of God. Who has all power. So one man is demanding truth from Jesus, the next day is orchestrated lies against the Savior to get him put to death. Such a hypocritical contradiction. But this was actually the first legitimate question put forward to Jesus throughout the entire trial. This is why the Lord answered him. It was a legitimate question. It was shown who Christ really is. It was another time for the Lord to say for who he is. He is the eternal Son of God. He is God manifest in the flesh. He is a promised Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of David. He is the Son of Man. So instead of the Lord sidestepping the question, he responded with authority and boldness and truth, of course, declaring his Messiahship and deity as the Son of Man relates to his Messiahship and um, right hand of power tells us in verse 62 relates to his authority as being God. Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting in the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. As Jesus declared with authority and boldness that he is the Messiah, and he is divine, that he is the one who is all power. Jesus knew this true statement would save his death warrant as they accused him of blasphemy, which was the death penalty in the Jewish law. For anyone to claim equality with God was regarded as blasphemy or defined a reverence by taking the Lord's name in vain was also blasphemy which was the death penalty in the Jewish judicial system. The Jews revered the Lord's name that much that they wouldn't even say it at times. Yet how many in our land take the Lord's name in vain? No fear of God, but they're going to be held accountable for it. If they don't repent and trust in Christ the Saviour to take away their sins. Caiaphas with his casual, or sorry, Caiaphas with his counsel reacted in a frenzy in a sense. There wasn't true stability here. There wasn't self-control here. Caiaphas, he, when he heard this, he ran his clothes in verse 63. And a frenzy. And the Jewish mob, the Sanhedrin, their mentality, 
Basically, they abuse them. They come out of the matter of control. As their sentence upon Jesus was illegal because Jesus was not guilty of blasphemy. Jesus was telling the truth where he was. He said that, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus sat in hangs and declared in his public ministry the great I am statements, I am the resurrection and the life. When he mentioned I am, the Jews knew that he was referring to God, the self existent, that's what that means. I am the self existent one, I am the self sustaining one. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world, the resurrection, the life, the true vine, I am the door. And so forth. But they accused him of blasphemy because they didn't believe that Jesus was the true Messiah. Despite the overwhelming evidence he gave them over the three over three years of ministry, multiple, multiple miracles upon miracles, no one spoke with authority like this. But their hearts were not hardened, they even heart of unbelief. They had already premeditated his death morning. This unjust maltreatment Jesus suffered at their hands was the fulfillment of scripture he told his disciples earlier. In Mark 10 he says, And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him. And this is what they did in verse 65, And some began to spit on him, and to cover his face, and to buffet him, and to say unto him, Prophecy. Prophesied and the servants that strike him with the palms of their hands were in a frenzy. These wicked actions of physical abuse of the Savior were fulfilled in Scripture. Jesus says that they would mock him, they would spit on him, they would scourge him. And these wicked men, the Sanhedrin, physically abused him. But they were being used by God to accomplish his redemptive purposes. Christ was not taken by surprise. Christ could have called down, we looked at it last week, 12, over 12 legions of angels to absolutely consume this world of the split second. He was not taken by surprise. He knew this was going to happen to him. He said to his disciples months previous to this account. That they would mock him, that they would spit upon him, that they would scourge him. He was not taken by surprise, he was not overwhelmed, he was not fearful, but was in complete control and perfect harmony of his Father's will and kind evil, as he meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, as God was in Christ, reconciling, reconciling the world of Jews and Gentiles unto him. Self, not imputing their trespasses unto them and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Christ was about to reconcile his redeemed people unto God through his ultimate sacrifice to become that atonement, to become that propitiation, to give us peace through his peace with God through his cross. Christ was in complete control of this situation. He was in perfect harmony with his Father's will and timetable. As he knew that God, Christ, was reconciling the world of Jews and Gentiles to redeem people unto himself. I wonder as it close, are you reconciled to God? Being in Christ. Or are you still his enemy? Just like the small Jesus is. Are you reconciled to God? We've heard a lot in this country over the years about reconciliation. But the most important reconciliation of all is are you reconciled to God being in Christ? Why did Christ allow us? Why did the Lord allow people to, to spit on him? And the physically abuse him, and scourge him, and hit them, hit him with the palms of their hands. This was only the beginning. Why did he allow this, folks? 
because God was in Christ reconciling the world of Jews and Gentiles unto himself as redeemed people. Are you in Christ today? Tonight, are you redeemed? Are you reconciled? Brought in the fellowship? Is it well with your soul? Have you peace with God? All your sins gone? Are you still his enemy? Just like this small Jesus face. Praise God that the Lord Jesus fulfilled the Father's will right to the very letter. Are you fulfilling the Father's will? Or maybe you're not even reconciled in the camp yet? Folks, there's come a day, and that's at the beginning of the sermon. This judicial system, every country needs a judicial system. Of course we do, we need law and order, or else we'll be on it. But we've seen here the twistedness, the pervertedness, the corruption. We've seen the, the greatest miscarriage of justice ever in a judicial system. And yet they had a good judicial system because God had given it through the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And yet they completely abused it, mishandled it, perverted it in the trial of Jesus. Such evil, such sin, such high-handed sin, no greater injustice ever. Of putting the Son of God, the perfect, eternal Son of God, to death. But they meant it for evil. God meant it for good. As God was accomplishing his redemptive purposes through his glorious Son. Tonight, have you a security? Have you an assurance that you're right inside with God? Because it's coming the day, folks, I've said before. Or imagine that as is appointed on the man and wants to die and after this judgment. There's coming a total, perfect judgment setting, judicial system. And no one can deceive God. Everything is negative for him. And God knows, Christ knows you are his. Are you in Christ? Are you saved from the wrath to come? May the Lord bless you through words to us this evening. Amen.